Hello. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, for coming here today. Um, I'm Chris Jelpe. I am the director of the Mershon Center here. Uh, and I'm very pleased to uh, welcome Isla Matnock uh, to come speak with us today. Um, Isla is going to be the first of our um, pair of speakers in, uh, peace, uh, from our Peace Studies Initiative. Uh, and I want to thank Kara Hoosier for um, uh, bringing Isla here and for our, our second speaker um, next semester as well. Um, I also uh, want to thank Kyle, Kyle's not here, um, uh, Kyle McRae and Kathy Becker for uh, their work in, um, in bringing together the logistics and also thank um, our new uh, event and program associate uh, Aaron Dyer who is, uh, uh, who is here uh, joining Mershon I guess for your first event here at, uh, at Mershon. So Aaron uh, comes to us, she has a degree from Wittenberg University in uh, International Studies and comes to us from um, Old Dominion University where she was doing uh, enrollment coordination so she'll be here um, at the Mershon Center now as our event and programming associate. So uh, thanks to all of you for um, making this event happen. Uh, we're very pleased to have um, Isla Matnock here from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, Isla is uh, very well known uh, for her um, work electing peace. Uh, which has, uh, which has attracted, I think, a lot of attention in the field. Uh, she's also um, the author of a number of articles, including uh, some very interesting um, field experiments in Colombia that I think we'll hear a little bit about from at the end. Uh, and so without further ado, um, welcome, Isla. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for having me. I'm um, really excited to be here today um, to discuss my book project. And then, uh, as Chris mentioned, I will turn a little bit to some of the survey experiments that we've been working on um, in uh, related field experiments uh, uh, at the end of the talk, um, just to give you a little bit idea of an idea about where this is headed and some directions that I think we really need um, future research in. Um, so maybe uh, one of you graduate students will end up uh, working on this. Um, I'm, I'm always hopeful. Uh, so. I'm going to um, overview the main claims, evidence, and then contributions of the book um, first. And so I'm going to go relatively superficially through some of the empirical evidence um, and the case study evidence, but I'm really happy to also talk more about that uh, in the Q&A. And I really look forward to your um, questions, comments, suggestions on both this book project, the um, survey experiments that I'll talk a little bit about, and um, some of the larger research agenda uh, as well. Okay, so this is the um, general structure of the book, um, and I'll be following this mainly for the talk today. I want to start off by talking about the puzzle, the concept, and the theory here. Um, to put this in context, this book is about civil conflicts. I think probably many of you in the room know that the casualties from civil conflicts dwarf the casualties caused by interstate wars in the modern era. We have about, as fi about five times as many deaths um, since 1945 caused by intrastate wars compared to interstate wars. Um, and in many cases, even when you can produce a settlement in these contexts, um, peace can be relatively pre precarious. Um, so settlements tend to fail, um, and there's pretty good data on this. The 2011 um, World Development Report indicated that more than 90% of all civil conflicts in the 2000s were actually recurrences of earlier civil conflicts. Um, and the evidence in this book will show that of the settlement signed between 1975 and 2005, um, pretty substantial settlements, 40% of these failed um, within five years. So constructing settlements between combatants has been a huge challenge, um, figuring out a way both to get combatants to sign them and to sustain them um, has been uh, a taken up by the literature, and that's where this book fits. And the argument that I'm going to make today is that some settlements hold, and that there are particular characteristics about settlements that can help them hold. And in particular, this book identifies electoral participation provisions uh, as a, cru a crucial component of why settlements succeed. So to start us off on the, on the puzzle and getting into the context here, there are pretty um, common views about post-conflict elections. Um, the use of participatory elections as a stabilizing feature in settlements to civil conflicts has been um, surprising to many. Um, there are people on the ground, combatants and democracy activists, who push for um, elections in post-conflict contexts. 
and intergovernmental organizations often supervise these elections in these contexts. Um, but many studying po the post-conflict context um, suggests that elections may uh, increase or at least not change the durability of peace. Um, some even suggest that these can be dangerous, um, reduce the chance for a s stable settlement, including some of um, Paul Collier's uh, work. Um, policymakers and ad academics, I think, uh, come to this conclusion in part because they focus on some difficult cases, including Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and in these cases, um, you know, thinking about post-conflict Afghanistan in 2009, for example, um, th these are held pretty hastily after conflict, um, and they're often just the incumbent government holding them and not bringing in the rebel group. So, for example, um, there have been efforts to bring the Taliban in as a political party, but those have never succeeded. So maybe the 2009 um, election in Afghanistan is not surprising in some ways that it didn't um, produce stability. In other words, um, the, those elections that feature rebel parties that participate as part of the peace agreement um, is something that's missed from many of these common views and that actually, as I'll show, uh, exists in many of these cases. Um, that's sort of the crucial difference that I'm going to suggest today overturn some of this co common wisdom around um, post-conflict elections, although not all of it. There is great work um, by Brancati and Snyder and Flores and Arudin, which suggests that having elections held further out from um, the conflict may actually be helpful in terms of producing peace, and many of those also have these rebel parties participating in them, so there are joint effects there. Okay, so what do I mean by electoral participation provisions? This is sort of the central conceptual um, piece uh, of this book project. The book posits that um, there are certain elections in which in peace agreements combatants have added clauses so that both the rebel group and the government will participate as parties uh, in the post-conflict context. These peace agreements um, reflect consensus by the opposing sides to hold elections. They don't differ all that much from other settlements in that in all cases we're getting two sides agreeing to do something, but specifically here they're agreeing to participate as political parties. Um, in almost all of these cases, the governments actually conduct the post-conflict elections. There's been almost no case where you see the existing government actually overturned um, with the uh, um, conflict before setting up these post-conflict elections. And so in practice, it's bringing in the rebel group as a political party. In theory, it could go the opposite way, but in, in, all of these, in almost all these cases, the, the um, government continues to hold power, and so it's bringing in the rebel group as a political party. To make this a little bit more concrete, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the FMLN in El Salvador um, throughout the talk today. So in 1980, there's a rebel group, a leftist guerrilla group, the Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front, FMLN in El Salvador, which challenged the um, Salv Salvadorian military regime. The UN um, began facilitating negotiations following a November 1989 request from the FMLN that it actually start uh, a process of, mo of moving towards peace with the government. The government agreed in January of 1990. The UN and supporting states, a group of friends there, um, actually facilitated negotiations that took two years, so between 1990 and 1992. Um, and in this process, the FMLN lobbied for electoral participation provisions. Um, they lobbied for this throughout the negotiations from their initial approach to the UN. And the deal linked many of the other provisions that were set up in the peace agreement to these electoral participation provisions. Things like demobilizing uh, forces had to be done uh, at particular points before you could do things like register candidates uh, in these um, upcoming uh, elections that would be held. Formally, um, the accords call for, quote, the legalization of the FMLN as a political party through the adoption of a legislative decree to that end. Um, the international community ended up uh, backing the agreement very strongly. There was a small UN monitoring mission, plus many larger uh, election observers who came in in the years following the settlement um, as power was redistributed in 1994. You can think of lots of other cases, electoral participation provisions um, were first included in this sort of set of post-90 um, elections, including in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1995. Burundi had later ones that have been in the news recently in 2000 and 2004, and there are the current efforts in Colombia 
where the FARC was brought in as a political party in 2016. So these are all examples of what I call electoral participation provisions in the book. And I'm interested especially in the provisions themselves, whether or not they're actually car carried out, although they are carried out in almost all of these cases. Okay, so aside from inter introducing this idea of electoral participation provisions, the book theorizes about both the causes and consequences of um, including these electoral participation provisions. And I think, if nothing else, I hope that you'll take away these two empirical points, which I think are what the book um, demonstrates at its core. Um, the first is that settlements to conflict are increasingly based on these provisions to have electoral participation provisions, establishing these rebel political parties. Um, and so in post-Cold War cases, um, almost half of all, re of all uh, negotiated settlements have these. The other takeaway point is when um, these uh, negotiated settlements have these uh, electoral participation provisions, um, the provisions are associated with an 80% increase in the chance um, that the settlement will produce lasting peace. And so in many of these, this is measured as um, five years out from the conflict. But we actually only see two cases where they relapse even later than that, um, 10 years out from the conflict. Um, and those are both uh, cases without electoral participation provisions. Um, so these results, I think, are really interesting. They emerge from an examination of 122 peace agreements and 388 civil conflicts between 1975 and 2005. I'll talk more about the data. They also emerge from case studies that crossed the end of the Cold War. Um, so I examined a set of 10 cases that were all active during the Cold War and then ended after um, the Cold War ended. And I'll talk about why that's important, but it's important to be able to test my theory. What is the theory? So to preview, the book develops a theory that electoral participation provisions facilitate external engagement to monitor and, and enforce combatant compliance with negotiated settlements. So the idea is that international actors are using electoral pr um, provisions to enable peacekeeping. They're producing less uh, precarious settlements by doing this and more enduring peace between signatories. And I'll tell you more about how this works, but I think this is an important point is that this book really comes at this um, for, and recognizes the international perspective on why these elections are important rather than thinking about this more through domestic processes such as developing sort of cooperation within the country in these post-conflict periods. Um, and the survey evidence that I'll come to at the end in Colombia suggests that this may really be true, that these are very much elite processes overseen by international actors when they're successful and that they don't always build democracy. So that's something to flag now um, and that I'll, that I'll come back to. Okay, so I'm going to say a little bit more about the theory um, and then I'll turn uh, to the causes and the evidence on the causes and consequences, the main pieces of evidence that emerge um, from those book chapters. Okay, so common views of peacekeeping now rather than post-conflict elections are um, that it's actually a pretty puzzling issue when you think carefully about its cost. So there's been a lot of uh, existing work that suggests that international actors are needed to help conflicts end. This is, uh, you know, started by Barb Walter's work, um, or at least that's sort of the main uh, citation in a lot of this literature. Um, but these ideas have been floating around in the, in the civil conflict um, context. The big question here is how do you overcome credible commitment problems? So when you have two actors, a rebel group and a government, thinking simplistically, they have to first identify a bargain that benefits each of them compared to continuing fighting. That's often available to them relatively soon after they start fighting um, because their capabilities don't really change very much in most of these cases. And so bluffing is really difficult. And so usually they can identify terms that would benefit them relative to, keep, to continuing to fight. However, even if they can identify a mutually beneficial bargain, the risk that one combatant side will become temporarily stronger during the implementation of the peace agreement um, can derail plans for peace. If the opponent, if its opponent grows concerned that the other may make a power grab, it might refuse to sign the agreement initially, or it might return to uh, fighting either preemptively or as, or as punishment after it signed an agreement. So these fears are what we call um, credible commitment problems, and they can, be, uh, they can be resolved by arrangements that reduce the benefits of noncompliance, so reduce the benefits of grabbing power. Um, the typical solution suggested is that combatants uh, need to have some sort of international guarantee. So under this solution, international actors would attempt to change combatants' behavior 
through either the threat or actual use of force. A threat might deter noncompliance, but if deterrence fails, then the threat needs to actually be executed. So the international actors have to be um, credibly committed to, these, to enforcing these deals as well, if they're actually going to make a, the idea of punishing a non-complier credible. So military coercion is used in many cases of conflict. We see this in Libya, for example, um, to punish one side or the other. But it's pretty unlikely in post-conflict contexts, I think. And I argue that for a few different reasons. First, armed international intervention is costly. It costs a lot to send arms and material to these cases. It also is costly in terms of the potential for casualties um, of these peacekeeping uh, endeavors. It's also true that punishment by force may be pretty disproportionate to the kinds of violations that happen in a lot of these post-conflict contexts. I'll talk more about those in the next slides. But often these are political violations. They have to do with renegotiating the amount of political power that each side has in these post-conflict contexts. And so to think about actually punishing a side with force for making a political violation um, seems disproportionate uh, in many of these cases. So what these common views miss is that many international actors are actually engaging through non-military mechanisms. And that's sort of the central piece of the argument that I want to make today. So how does international intervention work? Um, this photo is also from the FMLN case in El Salvador. And what you can see here um, on the left side is a caravan of FMLN fighters going in to demobilize at an arms collection point. And what you can see on the right-hand side here is a UN vehicle that's following along with them. This is a whole trek of fighters, and there's a whole caravan of them behind this. On the UN side, there are a couple of unarmed observers watching this process, right, observing this process. And this is pretty typical of what we see in post-conflict contexts. So what keeps the government from violating the terms of the deal at this point and cutting rebels out of power? Rebels often are asked to demobilize in these cases, and so what keeps them trusting that the terms of the deal will be uh, kept? So how do uh, UN missions work in many cases is really the question that I'm asking, and how do post-conflict um, elections fit into them? The book offers a conception of enforcement by international actors whereby they're changing the cost of uh, you're, they're changing the calculation of cost for noncompliance for the combatants. They're reducing the amount of power that they can grab at any particular moment and what the benefits are of doing that. But they're doing it through mechanisms that are not force. So thinking about the case of El Salvador, let me give you a couple of examples, then I'll make the theory a little bit more, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make the points in the theory a little bit more rigorous in the next um, slide. So in the case of El Salvador, the UN and the US both leveraged the incentives that they could offer in the aftermath of this 1992 agreement that was signed in this case. They especially used foreign aid uh, in this case. So for example, major concerns arose in the case over whether the government would actually provide the amount of power that had, it had promised the FMLN. And so in this case, that power is going to come through elections. That's how we're going to get this power distributed between the two sides. And so it was of substantial concern to the rebels that the government would renege on this deal once they didn't have weapons to sort of force it to keep, to keep its promise. And there were a couple of particular issues that the rebels pointed to as particularly problematic. So the government was supposed to ex expedite the processing of voter registration cards in this period for more than a quarter of the population of Guatemala. They slowed this process. And that's problematic because most of these supporters who didn't already have voting cards were leftists who supported the FMLN. So this would have greatly um, reduced their vote share when they actually went to the polls. In response, um, the UN recognized this complaint as valid. They noted that the timing uh, that the government had promised was not anywhere close to what it was actually going to meet, bringing in technical experts to sort of predict uh, how many people would be registered in each week. Um, and in response, Congress froze, U.S. Congress froze $70 million um, of economic support funds in August 1993, so right in the lead up to the elections. The aid freeze uh, was effective. It produced an increase in the, in the pace of registration, and the U.N. said that ultimately 90% um, of potential voters were registered by the November deadline um, that they were seeking to meet. Okay, so another noteworthy instance um, of an attempt by the government to uh, reduce the amount of uh, power that the rebels had was to move polling stations and FMLN strongholds 
um, to capitals of those departments. This is another way to disenfranchise their supporters. It would take a half day's walk to get into these department capitals, and so this was essentially a mechanism to reduce their vote, their vote turnout. Um, the government claimed that there was a security risk in these contexts. Um, the UN actually disputed that and offered to send um, security personnel to these polling stations just to observe the process. They wouldn't have been armed uh, in these cases, um, but basically calling the government's bluff on these, and uh, ultimately the government did leave um, the polling stations where they were supposed to be uh, in these departments. So. These are all mechanisms that don't actually entail power, but they were at, at a, about a crucial part of the, of the peace process, which is the implementation part. And in particular, the rebels here were especially concerned that the government was not going to meet its obligations in terms of giving it the amount of power that it, uh, that it had negotiated in the agreement. This comes also on the government side with the rebels. So the government also feared that the rebels would renege. And in fact, there was um, an arms uh, department found, uh, a storage room of, of, of weapons that was found that own, was owned by the FMLN uh, in this case as well. And um, the government threatened that it wouldn't allow it, the FMLN's candidates to register in that case until it had revealed and disposed of any other arms um, caches that it had uh, in that case. Um, and this was actually something that the UN backed um, when the government made that threat. So the government has the power in many of these situations to sort of deal with these possible reneggings by the rebel group, whereas the rebel group can have a much harder time dealing with it with the government. Um, and so it's where it, it, that's often where these electoral participation provisions come in. So to think about this a little bit more systematically, the book argues theoretically that electoral participation provisions help enable this low cost and credible type of external enforcement over time. The provisions um, establish cycles whose culmination is the distribution of political power between the participating ex-combatant parties. And so non-compliance can, non can be really difficult to otherwise identify and to punish. Um, but these benchmarks uh, really help tie regular milestones to the cycle in a way that clarifies um, and enables multiple actors to pro provide information about um, compliance for both sides. This coordination of uh, incentives by international actors, especially at crucial moments when political power is distributed, um, raises the expected cost of non-compliance for both sides. They might lose U.S. funding uh, in the case in El Salvador that I just mentioned. This book also argues that the systemic changes that began at the end of the Cold War reduce the cost for international actors to enforce uh, uh, peace agreements through electoral participation provisions, especially as international democracy promotion programs spread. They rapidly pro proliferated in the post-conflict or in the post-Cold War period, um, and so these were begin. To, uh, were seen as a legitimate mechanism to distribute power for, between two sides, but also to bring in international actors in a way that was not seen as violating the sovereignty of these states, and that was done fairly frequently in many of these cases. And so international actors could use the democracy promotion programs to involve themselves in these cases. And I think that's another really important um, piece of the theory here. So it's not just the mechanisms in the elections, but it's also the timing of this uh, spread of democracy promotion programs that made it so easy and effective to use this particular mechanism for international engagement. There are other cases in which international uh, actors can't use electoral participation provisions in which we see the government subtly altering the power distribution between the two sides in later years. So in Chad, for example, the government negotiated with each rebel group that had agreed to come in and offered them seats in the uh, ministry or uh, other positions of power in the government. But once more rebel groups came in, the government just added more ministry positions, essentially dividing the power of those who had come in earlier and reducing the amount of power that they held. And it eventually led, um, the, in the, that case, back to conflict. And so I think you know, that's a contrasting case that we see here, where in both cases we're getting a political settlement, we're getting some distribution of political power. But in these cases, is it easier to monitor whether the government in particular is actually keeping its promise? Um, and uh, following through on implementation and raise the cost if they're not through these non-military mechanisms. Okay, so I've told you a lot about the theory. Let me turn um, to some of the empirical implications um, of the theory. 
The book tests um, both the causes and consequences of um, electoral participation provisions, as I mentioned. And so this first set um, relates to the causes. The first set of observable implications that emerge from the book are about the causes. So we suggest, uh, in, the, in the argument, I suggest that the first indicator should be that we were more likely to see electoral participation provisions after the Cold War ends. This is a period in which we're really seeing rising rates of involvement, international involvement in democracy promotion programs. And so this offers this mechanism to international actors to engage in this relatively cost-effective way in post-conflict elections. I'm then also going to argue that international engagement did not extend uniformly to all regions in the world. So it spread first to Latin America, and then uh, Eastern Europe, and it only was much later that we get this type of international democracy promotion programs in serious ways in, in places like Asia. And so the um, democracy promotion programs, when they're not proffered by these international actors or when states have special strategic or um, uh, other ties to uh, international enforcers, they're seen as much less credible. They simply won't go into these states to do the type of observation needed, or they're not providing the type of funding um, to these states that's needed to withdraw or freeze in the cases of violations. Or finally, they're just expected to be very biased towards the government, and then it would not be a credible mechanism by the rebels to enforce this um, deal. So we should expect to see in these cases both that we see an increase after the end of the Cold War, but that we also see regional, regional differences in these um, rates. And so the way that I measure that is looking at um, the percent of elections that have been observed and that have received democracy aid uh, in the past year in the region. So if your region has pretty high rates of democracy promotion programs, it's likely that the expectations are that you will have pretty high rates of, of um, that you have pretty high likelihood of receiving this type of democracy promotion program. Um, and there's pretty good work about why these spread um, regionally um, in, in Susan Hyde and Judith Kelly's work. Um, so that part is not novel, but it's very useful uh, in testing my theory. And then there are exceptions of states that have sort of special or strategic relationships. We should not expect those states to necessarily have um, the same rate of uh, use of electoral participation revisions. So let me show you those results. This is the first um, set, so the uh, bars, the white bars that you can see here are all agreements, all peace agreements um, coded uh, in this period. I use the UCDP um, peace agreement data set, but I cluster um, uh, negotiations as um, accords. So there is a whole set of agreements that are signed, for example, in El Salvador between 1990 and 1992, but they're very clearly part of the same process. Um, and so those are all coded as one um, peace agreement, final peace agreement in this data set. The overall list of peace agreements that I then have looks quite similar to the peace um, accord matrix that comes out of Notre Dame. So the data sets actually are pretty similar once you, you cluster um, in this way. The white bars are peace agreements, as I mentioned, and the dark bars are electoral participation provisions. So what you can see is that there are also many more peace agreements in the post-Cold War period, as well as um, many more electoral participation provisions. Um, but the effect here is um, statistically significant um, across these results. So about 40%, about 50% of these agreements have um, participation provisions in the post-Cold War period. These are pretty basic tests of the other expectations that I have, um, but just to show you uh, in the interest of the talk, um, the first is the rate of regional election observation. So this is the number of elections in the region in the past year that were observed by international actors. Um, and you can see where you have low rates of regional election observation, we get much lower rates of political participation. The same is true on the bottom where we have um, regional democracy aid. And so this, again, is the uh, percentage of, of countries receiving um, regional democracy aid in the country in the past year. Um, and the rates are lower among those who are receiving low levels of this compared to those that are receiving high levels of this. And in this particular chart, that's broken down just by the mean, uh, you know, if you're above or below the mean there. So all of these relationships are statistically significant. I think as a whole, they, they contribute to, the, to supporting the idea that we're likely to get these electoral participation provisions in contexts where um, we actually have some 
uh, uh, some expectation that international actors will engage through these processes. And these should be places in which rebels demand um, these pr provisions because they think that they will actually protect them. I won't talk about the special and strategic relationships in, in this slide, but I'm happy to do that more uh, in the Q&A if you're interested. So the other piece of evidence that I, I want to turn to is on um, the uh, qualitative side. And here I think it's really important to think about um, the ways in which we should see these uh, provisions coming into effect. One of the most important things is that my theory predicts rebel groups will be the side that is likely to request these provisions because they are often going to be the ones who are more protected by having these provisions in place. And I find this to be true across all 10 cases that I examine that end with the end of the Cold War. Um, and it's true from rebel groups that are far to the left and don't support um, elections as well as U.S. backed uh, groups that do support elections. So there isn't any difference based on their ideology among the case studies. Um, and in fact, ideology is not statistically significant in the analyses. It's true across the board that the rebel group is the one that initiates the request um, for these electoral participation provisions. And I think Guatemala provides a nice case in which we can do a little bit of process tracing. El Salvador is also in the book. Um, but in Guatemala, there was this civil war, but in, uh, again, between leftist combatants um, and a right-wing government that was fought between 1960 and 1996. Um, and it was U.S.-backed. And so in this case, we have a really hard time, we have a really hard case in which we need to see the perception of international actors change in the case before the rebel group in particular will trust them as an enforcer. Um, I think this is similar to some of the cases we see today, um, like uh, the Taliban uh, in Afghanistan. So the end of the Cold War in this case was really helpful to demonstrate more neutral intervention. So in the years leading up to the end of the Cold War, we see lots of documents coming out from the URNG that state in unconditional terms that there's no way that they would feel protected um, in any type of peace agreement and there's no way they're coming in um, to participate in a peace agreement. They then start saying, okay, maybe we'll participate in a peace agreement. We clearly are in a stalemate. Um, but uh, they don't, it's not until after the end of the Cold War that they start proposing that they might actually seriously come to the negotiating table and do start negotiating in 1993, although the process stalls. I think the URNG is particularly cautious in Guatemala because they were a very small and weak group, and so they really felt that the commitment problems were going to bind in this case. Um, and there's a lot of good uh, evidence that um, people provided to me in that case that I'm happy to talk more about. But I think one of the main turning points was in 1993 when the then President um, Serrano perpetrated what's called a self-coup. So he suspended the Constitution and other branches of government and he took back more power from himself, clearly violating sort of rules of the game in Guatemala. And it was at that moment that the U.S. and the OAS both immediately uh, threatened to withhold assistance and limit trade. Um, and the U.S. actually did enact um, that, the uh, freezing of aid. U.S. State Department spokesman at the time said there's no justification to resorting for, to non-democratic means. Um, and so in my interview with a URNG member, uh, Carlos Mejia, who's now a politician um, in Guatemala, he said that there were a lot of resources poured into letting people know that, the, that any accords that were reached um, would actually be complied with and that the U.S. would support that at this moment. And so this was really an important moment in sort of changing attitudes. And in general, the end of the Cold War was a, an important moment in changing attitudes um, that the international community became more interested in ending these civil conflicts um, and resolving uh, conflicts rather than um, sort of siding and backing one side or the other. Okay, so I'm not going to talk too much about the other expectations, just in the interest of time, but I'm really happy to come back to the case studies. I think, um, for me, they were one of the most impor uh, important and interesting parts of the book to write. What I want to do instead is turn to the second set of implications of the external engagement theory, which suggests that um, electoral participation provisions should improve the chances of stable peace uh, in the longer run. And so uh, the way that they do that is by enabling this enforcement that I've discussed in the El Salvador case. Um, and so what we should expect is that electoral participation provisions are associated with a more durable peace, but also that it should be especially the case when they're correlated with an interaction with electoral, uh, sorry, with international involvement. So if we have ex strong expectations that the international 
uh, community is going to involve itself through these electoral participation provisions, that's where we really should see these beneficial effects of signing on to these agreements. And so to show you some of the data here, um, this is uh, months after the peace agreement on the x-axis here, and this is survival of peace on the y-axis. And what you can see is that in both cases, some uh, settlements fail, whether or not you have electoral participation provisions, but that they fail much less um, when you have uh, electoral participation provisions, which is the upper dotted line, than when you don't have these electoral participation provisions. And this is demonstrated much more rigorously um, in the uh, paper in a variety of ways with a variety of uh, controls and other uh, model specifications. But I think the other really important uh, and interesting point to note on this here, um, I'll skip the rest of it, but I'm happy to talk about it, is that we can also put the regional percent of election observation or the regional percent of democracy aid on this x-axis and interact these two terms. So in this, um, in this uh, chart, what you have is over on the right-hand side, you have 100% of regional election observation. Uh, so all missions, all elections in the past year in that region were observed by election ob observers. On the left-hand side here, you have 0% of elections in that region were observed um, in the past year by international observers. And what you can see is the dotted line, again, shows this decrease in the likelihood that you'll return to conflict within five years. And you can see that it decreases, but only for only over, time, over uh, election observations. So you only are finding these statistically different effects, these beneficial effects to peace here, where you have electoral participation provisions and you have high rates of these sort of uh, proxy measures for expectations of international engagement. The um, sort of uh, bars that you kind of see at the bottom are just a fraction of observation, so you know where the data are uh, in this chart, but I'm happy to talk more about that too. Okay, so turning finally to the uh, set of case studies that support this, I come back to the 10 cases that cross the end of the Cold War, and again, I focus in on process tracing in, in Guatemala and El Salvador for these. I've talked about some of the evidence uh, in El Salvador in an earlier slide about how the U.S. and others threatened punishment um, and even uh, removed benefits when noncompliance was detected in these cases. The chapter also examines the two cases of failure uh, for my theory among these 10 cases in the post-Cold War period, which are Angola and Cambodia. And I'm happy to talk more about those. Angola was a really early case of this, and I think in some ways it's very instructive and interesting in terms of the scope conditions that have to be present. It also examines how tenuous a settlement can be when it doesn't have participation provisions uh, in the case of Bangladesh, um, which is another, another case that I examined, which in some ways looks similar to El Salvador and Guatemala, but doesn't have electoral participation provisions. There are a lot of other examples, and I'm happy to talk more about those or, or cases that are of interest to you. But for now, what I want to do is turn to some conclusions and implications, and here just talk for a moment about um, some of the evidence that we have in the Colombian case which I think presents uh, kind of a hard uh, challenge to this theory um, on the front of democracy, if not peace. Okay, so overall, I think the, the book speaks to what we know in, in several ways. It overall offers a mechanism for engaging external actors um, when available that can help stabilize settlements. I think electoral participation provisions when included in peace agreements um, reduce the cost and thereby increase the credibility of engaging external actors to actually um, uh, help stabilize peace. But it suggests sort of a new role and mechanism for doing that compared to what we've seen from international uh, intervention in the past. So in these findings, the book contrasts prevailing pessimism uh, and I think presents a corrective to some of the literature on post-conflict um, peace agreement, or sorry, post-conflict uh, elections, which have generally been pretty p pessimistic. It highlights the importance of distinguishing between these different types of post-conflict elections. And then building on the theory tied to the um, the empirical implications, I think the book's central uh, the central contribution is understanding the international, uh, the ways in which international actors actually engage to enforce settlements. We've known for some time, it, based on a lot of really great um, political science work, that this is a crucial mechanism for securing peace in civil conflicts, is getting international actors to, to engage. But thinking about how they actually do that 
um, I think is, is different in this project than in many others. Military coercion is often not credible, not a credible mechanism to use in my view because um, of the costs, uh, often tempting international actors to withdraw, um, especially when there is non-compliance rather than punish it. Um, and so the external, act, uh, external mechanism that's um, suggested here is that um, finding a low cost, this, the, the, this finds a low cost mechanism to both monitor and uh, engage uh, in these post-conflict contexts. Thinking about the policy implications then, if the book is correct, um, this suggests that policymakers don't need to shy away from promoting post-conflict elections, um, that they could suggest them in these post-conflict contexts, and that even much hated combatants seeking to transform to political parties should perhaps be encouraged to do so. Um, UN and other international actors could even go as far as proposing electoral participation provisions um, and linking um, provisions like demobilization disarmament to these provisions. Not all combatants are going to welcome these provisions in all settlement cases, so each side must first see the conflict as costly um, and uh, know that they're not likely to win outright, um, which are expectations that we have from the general literature for peace agreements, but they also have to then uh, have this expectation that international actors will actually engage through this electoral mechanism be before it becomes really um, useful to them. Outside actors can help here too, though, by reassuring combatants um, that the terms of the deal that they'll sign will actually be enforced. And they can do this in a couple of different ways. Um, they can explicitly condition their aid on compliance with the peace agreement, and they can explicitly condition their monitoring on compliance with the peace agreement. We actually see a lot of cases where um, foreign actors are monitoring and offering aid conditional on the peace agreement, but they don't always make that explicit. Um, in all of their writing and, uh, and uh, study of those cases. And so I think that that's one really um, useful thing that these actors could do. Um, in fact, there's a 2010 report on the Bosnian elections which says, we don't really like uh, electoral quotas, we don't support them, but given that this is, was in the Dayton Peace Accords, um, the, the elections met the rules of the game. And I think being explicit that what they're expecting is that they will meet the rules of the game can be beneficial to peace. Um, okay, and then finally, it's important that international actors are actually funding uh, intergovernmental organizations in particular that are doing a lot of this work um, in terms of doing the election observation in post-conflict context is almost always done by the UN uh, in the first year, the first election after um, the uh, conflict ends and often um, by one of these intergovernmental agencies down the road. Um, and so I think, you know, the UN, the U.S. pays largest share of the UN peacekeeping budget, and it's been a pretty pr crucial participant in this. And so um, in recent years, uh, recent months, we've seen Washington's interest uh, waning in some of these functions. So U.S. Ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley, tweeted that they've cut over half a billion dollars from UN peacekeeping budget, and they're only getting started. But the evidence in this book would suggest that support of this type, supporting this type of international engagement may be actually a really low cost mechanism to secure some of these states that could otherwise present, prevent, present transnational problems. Okay, so I wanna just take the last few minutes I have to turn to the case of Colombia because I think it's a really interesting one um, for the book and also um, it happens to be ongoing. Uh, so perhaps of policy relevance as well. Colombia is pretty close to ending a 50-year civil conflict with leftist guerrillas. Many of you have probably seen the deal that brought the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, the FARC, uh, into an agreement uh, in, 19, uh, in uh, 2016 um, and finalized a peace agreement. The peace agreement does take the form that we would expect um, from much of this research, which is electoral participation provisions. The FARC is, uh, has become, at this point, a political party uh, in Colombia. Um, and uh, an interesting aspect um, that we can test in this case is, is the dimension of how um, these deals are perceived by the, by the general population. So an important point that I highlight throughout the book is that these deals are really elite deals. In many ways, they're using elections to share power between a set of elites on the government side and a set of elites on the rebel side. They're coming to a deal, um, but they're not always very open to the to the public, and they often don't ask the public to weigh in in very many ways. So 
Some of these go as far as having um, quotas, ethnic quotas, for example, or special seats reserved for the rebel group. So they are using the electoral framework, but they're actually not very open to the vote uh, in many of these cases. And so uh, we're able to actually look at some of the attitudes towards the Colombian process. Um, we were able to run a, a survey uh, in 2015, just before the deal was finalized, um, and the plebiscite actually failed. And what we show in that article is that um, there's a potential democracy stability trade-off um, in which these provisions often do exclude voters in some ways and are seen as very unpopular among voters. So what we did is we um, looked at the overall peace accord, which was rated with much more support than the particular provisions of the peace agreement, which were rated with less support. And then finally, we had an endorsement experiment where the FARC endorsed those provisions in some cases, said that they supported a provision. And we then saw a much uh, deeper drop in support even um, than, in the, than in the prior cases. So I think the overall um, rate of support for the particular provision we were looking at went down from 44% support to 31%, so a pretty big drop. And I think that this comes to the fact that, um, you know, there, it is unpopular often to give these type of concessions, but especially these concessions that legitimate a rebel group that has been um, vi uh, villainized uh, in the um, press and otherwise in the country. Now, there's potentially an interesting, unique component of the Colombian process, which is that a divided elite may be dri driving some of the dis dissatisfaction. So the government side is actually split over whether or not um, there should be a, the, the peace process that's currently taking place with the FARC is the correct peace process. And so the former President Uribe, who's very charismatic and whose party just won the spring elections, um, he, is, he has not been supportive of the peace process, to say it mildly, um, whereas the current, or the President uh, Santos, who negotiated the um, deal, was much more supportive. And we see a big elite divide. So maybe the case that average voters are not particularly pleased with these um, uh, deals, but they may be sort of be able to be sold on it as long as all of the elites are on board with the agreement. It still poses a further challenge over time, though, if these are elite deals that are sold by the elites to the population, they may end up being pretty undemocratic in these ways, having quotas, having special seats, or otherwise sort of maintaining the status quo, but just bringing in these new actors, the rebel group as a political party, um, without really bringing in uh, the population's um, vote uh, to this process. And we've seen some years down the road protests in some of these cases um, in Bosnia and Burundi um, and Mozambique over the way in which the, the uh, general population has not been involved in these processes. So I think this is in some ways a warning uh, uh, and also a potential um, sort of limitation of the theory, which is that these electoral participation provisions can be really helpful to peace but that they're being used explicitly to build peace in these post-conflict contexts, and they may not actually be very helpful um, to democracy. And I think that's something that we um, need to study further. Okay, so just mention um, the broader research project. I think you know there are many domestic deals that are signed on a variety of dimensions between governments and their opponents that have to overcome these commitment problems, which are often subtle and asymmetric. Um, we've thought a little bit about this in economic literature. How do you get the uh, government to continue um, complying with the deals that it signs? But I think especially thinking about conflict, thinking about protection of human rights, deals with trade organizations, deals with unions, that this may offer some um, similarity to those other cases in which uh, trying to, get, trying to uh, have domestic opponents have a credible deal signed between them may require bringing in these international actors to observe um, and potentially offer a corrective um, should one or the other side not comply with those deals can be really useful. Um, and that certain conditions may actually um, help uh, facilitate external engagement. And specifically, this paper um, highlights the use of what I call in the book systematic spotlighting, but basically elections, moments at which there's a lot of information provided by a bunch of different actors and international actors are especially involved. Um, that those may be a mechanism that's useful across a broader set of cases than just conflict cases um, to really engage these uh, international actors. So I'll leave it there. I'm really looking forward to your um, comments and suggestions about the project um, or the larger research agenda. Thanks so much for having me.